All right, here we are, a journey to the cross, a journey to the resurrection. Uh, we are in a sermon series right now uh, based on the text from 1 Corinthians where we are called to preach Christ crucified. And in the world that we're in today, there's a lot of people who wonder who we are, meaning who is the church, what, what is the message, and What is this proclamation that you're doing inside, behind the church walls? Some people have never been inside of a church to hear preaching or to hear God's Word. Yes, I'm not making it up. It's it's true. And then when you think about who Christ is, what, what is Christ? What does that mean? Is that a historical person, a mythological figure? Uh, who is Christ? And then what does it mean to be crucified? And maybe of all likelihood, It's that last one because of the global education systems and the studies of, you know, capital punishment that they probably have gotten sometime in their high school years or maybe their college years and and knowing that the Roman Empire and and other empires used crucifixion. It's it's highly possible that uh, people would know more about what crucifixion is than they know about anything else about the church, about what we proclaim or about the Christ. And that's why we have the text we have today. This Christ, the anointed one of God. Romans chapter 5, by the way, if you're following along, you can uh, turn to page 1119 in your pew Bible in front of you. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, this is where uh, the creative mind gets going, right? Because it's really easy for us to talk about all the ungodly things that we see out there, the ungodly wars and the injustice between on the border there of, of Russia and Ukraine, Gaza and Israel, and the lists go on and on and on about ungodliness. And so often it's easy for us to talk about others. And yet that's not where I want to go this morning. And, you know, I have a really creative mind. I'm getting texts from other folks that are uh, encouraging me to watch videos, and I, I love that. I know some of you members are sending me things. Hey, Pastor, what do you think about this prophecy? What do you think about this uh, headline in the news? And if, that's good. Let's talk about it. Let's go into Bible study about it. it it's really important, but this morning we're not going to go there because I don't think that's where this text takes us. For while we, that's you and that's me, while we were weak, yes, even after becoming a baptized child of God, washed in the forgiveness of sins, we still remain weak. And oftentimes the behaviors, the attitudes, the mindset we have regarding Jesus Christ and His mission are ungodly and sinful at best. How are you doing on these Ten Commandments? You know, last week, uh, Pastor Jim walked you through one and two, not having any other gods. You know, do you fear? Do you love? Do you trust in this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, more than all things above all other things? Let's think about it this morning. Second commandment, our language, the misuse, and, uh, you know, the teaching, and, and what we see actually in the gospel I'm going to refer to here in just a minute is one of Christ's dedicated, on-fire disciples, Peter, misusing, teaching wrongly about the Christ. And the third and fourth commandment doesn't take long, right, for us to start reflecting on how we honor the Word of God. And if we're taking that Sabbath rest and, and truly holding to the teachings of Almighty God. These are not teachings of Pastor Jim and Pastor Brent. The, we are echoing the living and active Word of God to you. Do you gladly hear it? Do you gladly learn it? in your daily life and journey. And then, of course, the honoring of authorities. How well are you doing? Are you honoring the authorities in a godly way, in your behaviors, 
in your obedience and to the authorities which God has put above us. We could flip over to a, a beautiful story in Mark chapter 8. It's on page 1002 in those pew Bibles. Jesus had fed the 4,000 in this account, and then he was giving, uh, talking about signs and the like. And he comes to his people, he comes to the disciples, and he says, who do people say that I am? You can ask that question yourself. Who do you say that Jesus is in your everyday life? In your everyday attitudes, who is Jesus? Is he in conversation with you? Are you communicating to, to him through hearing his word and responding in prayer? And, and here comes Peter, the super disciple, right? Peter says, uh, you are the Christ. You see, God had given him, uh, Jesus had walked with him, Jesus had called him, and uh, it was revealed to him and given faith to Peter so he could confess those words. Because w- without that, he wouldn't have known who Christ was. But he, he speaks the truth. Jesus is the Christ. That's his title. Christ comes from some Old Testament language. And literally, it means the anointed one. The one who is anointed to do a specific task. Now, there was an anointing of kings that God had raised up for certain tasks. But... Jesus, who's 100% God and 100% man in the one person Christ, is the only anointed one in the history of the universe, past, present, or anything in the future that has been anointed to come to this earth to live the life that God has outlined in the Ten Commandments and all of his other laws to be perfect and to accomplish that mission and then to Pay for your sins and mine. He's the anointed one. You know, so uh, Christ, Jesus, Christ is his title. The anointed one, Jesus, the Savior of the world. And what a beautiful thing that is. And it's fun, as we see in the confirmation classes here, three years, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, how more and more of the teachings from like the creeds and the teachings of prayer and the the teachings of the scripture come into the heart and mind of these kids and and the aha moments that happen, right? And they're, whoa, that's what what it means. That's the will of God for my life. This is the lifestyle he's outlining. And and then the ability, the apologetics, the ability to um, echo like Peter did here, the truth of the scripture. And, And to see these little disciples growing in the faith and and together with you, the parents, growing in the faith so that they can echo out to the world God's mission. But what happens next? And this is the challenge to us today. And this is the challenge that even though we're Christians, like Peter, we're followers of Jesus, is that in our hearts and in our minds about the way Jesus the Christ should be and carry out his mission can be very twisted and very dark, and very ungodly, because Jesus starts to talk about the mission of the Christ. The mission of the Christ was to do this, was that on, he began to teach them the Son of Man must suffer these many things and be rejected by the religious establishment, the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and that ultimately Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would be killed and after three days be raised again. This wasn't in the mind of Peter. He thought he was following a Christ, a Messiah, that was going to reestablish this kingdom of power and overthrow those pagan Roman overlords and set up his kingdom in that time on earth. But the kingdom of God is not the kingdom of this world. His reading of the Bible, a reading of those words, was skewed. He missed it. He was blinded. And so what does he do when Jesus starts to talk about the suffering that the Christ must endure to pay for the wrath of God? Peter pulls him aside and he rebukes Jesus. He rebukes the anointed one to carry out the salvation of the world. He rebukes him. That's ungodly to rebuke Christ. And how does Christ have to respond? Your Christ 
has to respond to any wrong teaching, false beliefs, inaccurate worldviews, and behaviors that are in your life because he's the Christ, because he's perfect, because he wants you to walk in the ways of the Lord, not in your own ways. And so Jesus rebukes Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see why it's important not to just read the text and go off into a bunch of front page news illustrations. The Holy Spirit, yes, wants us to wrestle with all of what ungodliness is going on out there in the world, but He wants us to wrestle with these texts in our own life, in our own weaknesses, in our own areas of ungodliness. If we had more uh, time, <laughs> we have a lot of time, but if we had more time, I, in this journey to the cross, this journey to Easter, I, I would love to just spend a few minutes in the sermons reading this text and letting the Holy Spirit bring to your mind your areas of weakness, your areas of ungodly, ungodliness. That's not to torture you. <laughs> But it's also not to distract you from the work that God, through His Word and through the Holy Spirit, wants to do on your heart to remove that ungodliness and those weaknesses so that you, in the power of the Holy Spirit, turn and receive that forgiveness. And like Pastor Jim last week uh, said, right? And Peter could have said this too. And I, I just wonder if, if he did after. What, what was it last week, Pastor Jim, right? Uh, congregation, get behind me, Satan. What? I am baptized. Peter, somehow, uh, Satan had gotten into his mind and had skewed his vision of what the Christ should be. And if there's areas in your life where your vision is skewed, I mean, think about what Jesus was doing. Not only is he not ex establishing the kingdom that, that the people wanted, but on top of that, he's, he's mixing up humankind. As the, the Jews and the Judaizers had put more and more barriers and obstacles to the Samaritans being in their midst, to the Roman overlords from being in their midst, uh, from the Gentiles, and here Jesus comes along to suffer and die for those sins, and Jesus comes along and changes the heart of the Samaritan woman, and crowds of people started flocking in. He, he reaches out to the Gentiles, and all of a sudden, on Pentecost, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that ungodliness of racism and separation and, and senseless man-made human laws was all removed. And he brought people into one body of Christ to be one people, worshiping God in many, many different languages, looking differently, dressing differently, but still the one Christ preaching Him who was crucified. Let's go back to Romans chapter 5, the core text of our message this morning, and look at those first few verses. Is this what I love about the Scripture? Uh, that even though the law of God sometimes comes crushing down on us to try to remove our ungodliness and sinfulness, he, he does that with the intent to restore you. Imagine hearing that. Imagine being Peter. He just confessed Christ. I'm doing well, Lord, in my walk with you. And then all of a sudden he says, after the statement of Peter, he says, get behind me, Satan. How crushing that is. Right? And when our eyes are opened uh, to the law of God and we're convicted by the Holy Spirit, it can be something that just borderlines draw up, takes us to the, the point of despair. Because we don't like being weak. Does anybody here like being weak? I don't like being weak. Does anybody like giving in to your ungodliness? I don't like giving in to my ungodliness. And so what does Jesus say? What does the text say? Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God 
Through whom? Through our own strength? No. Through, through our own uh, battles? No. Through Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 2, takes it even deeper. Through him, uh, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. You see how much God loves you is that while you're still a sinner, he puts you into a state of grace because he sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you on the cross. You're in that state of grace, and another word for that, a synonym for that is what? A state of undeserved love, unconditional love. That's in what you stand even while you struggle with your weakness, even while you wrestle and take one step forward and two steps back when you fall into your ungodliness. Access by faith, trusting in God and to this grace, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. What a beautiful thing. Doesn't that just restore your body and restore your soul? And just uh, cause you to want to journey to this cross. Because on the journey to the cross is where Jesus paid for your sin to give you hope and life and salvation. That your relationship to God doesn't depend on your perfection. And God knows that. That's why he sent Jesus. And also, uh, your journey with Jesus does not mean that you will be completely without suffering. It's not like the suffering Jesus did. When he paid for the sins of the world, that weight was more than any human being could bear except Christ. But we still suffer. The challenges of being in a fallen and sinful world, but what does the text say? What does that suffering do uh, to us, and how does it strengthen us? Uh, We rejoice in our suffering, verse 3 of chapter 5, if you're following along. We're knowing that the suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And that hope does not put us to shame. Because of why? Because of God's love which has been poured into our hearts. The heart of God and the love of God and the grace of God goes deeper than your ungodliness. And this is through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Thanks be to God. So sisters and brothers, as you wrestle, not just with the ungodliness around you or that's out there, but as you wrestle with your own ungodliness, remember these promises. That when we were still weak, in the midst of being weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Your sin is paid for. It's removed. That doesn't mean that we just go on sinning and and cheapen the grace of God and quench the Holy Spirit with our addictions and, and wrong behavior. No. Keep reading the text. Christ so loved you that we're reminded in verse 7, one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But here's the truth, that God shows his love for you, for each and every one of us. And you know what? It's not just for us in here. God shows his love for the whole world. Yeah, even the ungodly ones that you were first thinking about at the beginning of this message. Even the ungodly nations, even the ungodly government, even the ungodly governors and authorities, and go down the list. God shows his love for everyone, for all of us, that in while we all were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that is the trust which we will take us through all the struggles and the journeys that we go through because together as one church, together as one people, that's the beautiful message. Wherever you go and whoever you meet, you are called to share for together we preach Christ crucified. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.